The new ASUS SCAR 3 gaming laptop is a flashy looking machine, but can it back up these looks with some impressive performance? Let's take a look in this detailed review and help you decide if it's a laptop you should consider buying. Starting with the specs, I've got the G531GW model, which has an Intel i7-9750H CPU, NVIDIA RTX 2070 graphics, and that's the full 2070, no Max-Q here, and 16GB of memory and dual channel. There's a 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD for storage, and a 15.6-inch 1080p 240Hz IPS level screen. For network connectivity, it's got Gigabit Ethernet, 802.11 AC Wi-Fi, and Bluetooth 5. There are a few different configurations available though, such as with GTX 1660 Ti or RTX 2060 graphics, or even i5 or 8-core i9 CPU. You can find examples and updated prices linked in the description. The lid of the laptop is metal with a brushed finish and mirrored ROG logo towards the side. The rest of the chassis is all plastic and there were no sharp corners or edges anywhere. The interior has a carbon fibre texture and is all black. A nice improvement over the camo pattern in the previous SCAR 2 in my opinion. Another change from the older model is the RGB bar which runs along the entire left, front and right sides, giving it this sort of underglow effect. The weight is listed at 2.6 kilos on the ASUS website, and mine was closer to 2.3 kilos, though I don't have a 2.5 inch drive installed. With the 230 watt power brick and cables for charging, the total rises to just over 3.1 kilos. The dimensions of the laptop are 36 centimeters in width, 27.5 centimeters in depth, and just under 2.5 centimeters in height, making it a little deeper than other 15 inch machines. And that's because of this area towards the back that sticks out and acts as an air intake to improve cooling, but we'll see if this helps later. The smaller width allows us to have thinner screen bezels, though the bottom chin is larger. Something you may have noticed is ASUS haven't bothered including a webcam at all. The SCAR 2 at least had a nose cam down the bottom, but there's none here. While there's no webcam, it does still have a microphone, and here's how that sounds. The 15.6 inch 1080p 240Hz IPS level screen has a matte finish and good viewing angles. No G-Sync available here though. I've measured the color gamut using the Spider 5 Pro, and my results returned 97% of sRGB, 68% of NTSC, and 73% of Adobe RGB. At 100% brightness in the center, I measured 298 nits with a 850 to 1 contrast ratio. So about average brightness and a decent range of color gamut for a gaming laptop. Expect differences with the 144Hz panel though. Backlight bleed wasn't too bad, just a couple of small imperfections towards the bottom, though I never noticed these while actually viewing darker content, but results will vary between laptops and panels. There was more screen flex than I expected from the metal lid, though it is on the thinner side, however the hinges felt quite sturdy and they retract into the body when closing the lid. Absolutely no problems at all opening it up with one finger, it was quite well balanced and sat fine on my lap. The chiclet keyboard has per-key RGB backlighting, though the ASUS website seems confused and notes both this and 4-zone lighting, so not sure if you have the option of either. Unfortunately, it doesn't light up all parts of the keys. The F keys along the top light the secondary functions, just not the F number part. The WASD keys were identifiable by touch as the W key has a small extrusion, allowing your fingers to fill their way back. My only complaints are the small arrow keys given there appears to be space. Otherwise, the keyboard was nice to type with. Here's how it sounds to give you an idea of what to expect. Above the keyboard, we've also got shortcuts for volume up and down, microphone mute, profile change button to swap between silent, balanced, and turbo modes, more on that soon, and also a shortcut to open the ASUS Armory Crate software, which is basically their control panel. I did find it a little strange that they have two buttons for swapping between profiles. There's one above the keyboard, and one on the F5 key, which also needs you to hold down the function key. There are also some extra keys on the right hand side. There was a little keyboard flex while pushing down hard, but it seemed pretty sturdy and was perfectly fine during normal use. The touchpad has precision drivers, was smooth to the touch, and worked well. It's got physically separate left and right click buttons, and also has a numpad built in which is activated by touching the top right hand corner for about a second. When enabled, the touchpad can't be used. And while using the touchpad, I did enable the numpad twice by accident during the review process, as my finger must have paused over that corner. If a regular touchpad is essential, you'll need to look at the larger 17 inch version, which has one. Fingerprints and dust show up on the black interior, but despite the texture, I found them easy to wipe off. On the left, we've got three USB 3.1 Gen 1 Type-A ports, 3.5mm audio combo jack, and the left speaker. 
On the right, from the front to the back, there's the right speaker, keystone, more on that later, and an air exhaust vent. So no cables at all to get in the way of your mouse hand if you're right-handed. Those two 4 watt speakers on the sides sounded above average and actually alright for a laptop. Still clear at higher volumes with a tiny bit of bass. And at max volume while playing music they got fairly loud, though the latency mod results didn't look good. Speaking of sounds, by default it plays this one on boot. You can turn it off through the Armory Crate software or in BIOS though. On the back there are two air exhausts near the corners, then the rest of the I.O. From left to right there's the Gigabit Ethernet port and I like the way it's facing so you can pull out an Ethernet cable without having to lift up the machine. HDMI 2.0b output and USB 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C port with DisplayPort 1.4 support but no Thunderbolt, followed by the power input. The status LEDs are found towards the back above the keyboard and can be seen when the lid is closed. On the brushed silver metal lid there's the ASUS ROG logo towards the side which has RGB lighting. The logo on the back, light bar on the bottom, and keyboard are all set to the same effect. I wasn't able to customise them individually. I'm not sure if this might change with an update. My Armoury Crate software does note there's an update for AuraSync, but no matter what I did I couldn't get it installed. I also wasn't able to just turn off one independently of the others, but you can turn them all off, so it's all lights or nothing. Below the screen there's this sort of cutout area. In other machines like the FX505, the purpose was so that the bottom of the panel wouldn't block exhausting air when open. It's still making an appearance here so that the lid stays away from the air vents towards the back. And even with the lid closed, these holes are still available. Alright, let's talk about Keystone. This is basically an NFC chip in a plastic key that you plug in on the right hand side. And doing so will play this noise. It's got a magnet on it, so inserting it is very easy, but it doesn't feel like it will fall out. Basically, this is a physical token that the machine will recognise and apply your settings. So if you share the laptop with others, you can connect your keystone and the lighting and game settings should change based on your preferences. It's also got an option to unlock an encrypted drive on the laptop, so you can store… uh… things. I think this is a nice idea, but not going to be too practical unless you're sharing the machine with someone else. Underneath there are some air vents on the back half, though not as many as I'd like, and the rubber feet did a good job of preventing movement while in use. The bottom panel can be removed by taking out 11 screws with a Phillips head screwdriver, though the screws vary in size so you'll need to keep track as you remove them. You'll also want to be careful when removing the bottom panel, as there are two ribbon cables connecting it to the motherboard for the RGB light bar. On the inside, from left to right, we've got the single M.2 drive, single 2.5 inch drive bay, the battery, and two memory slots. Powering the laptop is a 66 watt hour battery. I've tested it with the screen brightness at 50%, background apps disabled, and all RGB lighting off. While just watching YouTube videos, it lasted for 4 hours and 54 minutes, about as expected, and it was using the Intel graphics in this test with Nvidia Optimus. While playing The Witcher 3 with medium settings and Nvidia's battery boost set to 30 FPS, the battery lasted for 1 hour and 11 minutes in total. However, after the first hour and 4 minutes, at 9% remaining, the frame rate dropped to 8 FPS and was no longer usable in this title. When you unplug the laptop from the power, it goes into the silent profile, and the screen will go black for a few seconds. You can manually change to balanced mode for increased performance, however turbo mode is not available on battery power. The 230 watt power brick that was included seemed to be adequate. I didn't have any battery drain during any of my testing. Let's move on to the thermal testing. I've got a whole separate video covering thermals in depth, so this will be an abridged version. Underneath, there don't appear to be many air vents, and there are also some intakes below the screen on this back section. Air is exhausted from the vents out the back and on the right hand side. Inside, the heat pipes are looking pretty good, and there are two shared between CPU and GPU. I'll also note that I've tested with a mixture of silent, balanced, and turbo profiles. The main differences are that the higher tier profiles boost fan speed, CPU TDP limits, while turbo also overclocks the GPU core and memory, as listed here. Thermal testing was completed in an ambient room temperature of 21 degrees Celsius, so expect different results in different environments. The idle results towards the bottom are on the warmer side as the fans were completely silent. The rest of these results are from combined CPU and GPU workloads. The gaming results towards the upper half of the graph were tested by playing Watch Dogs 2. While the stress test results on the lower half are from running the A64 CPU stress test with only stress CPU checked, and the Heaven benchmark at the same time to fully load the system. Basically we're seeing minimal changes to the CPU temperatures regardless of undervolting or using a cooling pad. 
However, we do see some improvements to the GPU shown by the green bars. In most tests, there was intermittent thermal throttling when the CPU would spike, and while this was not constant, I'd expect it to be more of an issue in a warmer environment. These are the average clock speeds for the same tests just shown. The undervolting gave the biggest improvement to CPU performance as power limit throttling was taking place under these tests. This is why there are smaller differences with the cooling pad as thermal throttling wasn't the primary issue. We do see some improvements by enabling turbo mode as it raises CPU power limits. Otherwise the GPU saw the biggest improvements to clock speed with turbo mode due to the overclocks that it sets. Here's the average CPU TDP for these same tests. Basically at balanced mode we're capped to 35 watts while under combined CPU and GPU workloads and this rises to 45 watts with turbo mode enabled. Here are some Cinebench CPU benchmarks showing single and multi-core performance. With the undervolt applied there was a nice improvement to the score, whereas at stock speed it's closer to what I'd expect from the older 8750H. In the newest Cinebench R20 there was a decent improvement with the CPU undervolt in place, and interestingly a small boost to single core result, though I'm not exactly sure why as this wasn't enough to cause detectable throttling. As for the external temperatures where you'll actually be putting your hands, at idle it was mostly in the low 30s, which is about average. Though the WASD area was a little warmer. While gaming it didn't actually get that hot. The wrist rest was the same 20 degrees and the center of the keyboard was in the low 40s but cooler towards the sides. Similar results with the stress tests running. There was a hotter spot towards the right near the air exhaust though, but it's off the keyboard. Here's the same test but with turbo mode and faster fans, which appears to slightly lower the temperatures of the externals. As for the fan noise produced by the laptop, I'll let you have a listen to some of these tests. At idle it was completely silent, no fan noise at all which is why the idle temperatures earlier were on the warmer side. While gaming with the balanced profile it's about average compared to many other gaming laptops I've tested. And then same results with the stress tests running. Once we enable the turbo profile though it does get a bit louder. Overall the ASUS SCAR 3 is running on the warmer side, and we weren't really able to improve this either by raising the fan speed with turbo mode, undervolting the CPU or using a cooling pad. These changes did help lower the GPU temperature, but the CPU didn't really change as power limit throttling was the primary limitation. With that said, there was intermittent thermal throttling in most tests when the CPU would briefly spike up and trigger it. As I tested with a 21 degree room temperature, it would be interesting to see how a slightly warmer room goes. It may be the case that thermal throttling becomes more constant in that scenario. In any case, thermal throttling was far less of an issue than power limits which is why we were able to get improvements by combining turbo mode and undervolting. Next, let's take a look at some gaming benchmarks. I've tested these games with these Nvidia drivers and all available Windows updates installed with the turbo profile in use for best performance. And as a reminder, this does overclock the graphics a bit. Battlefield 5 was tested in campaign mode and not in multiplayer mode as it's easier to consistently reproduce the test run. The purple bars show the results with ray tracing disabled while the green bars show RTX on. As always seems to be the case, this game looks better, at least in my opinion, with RTX off with ultra settings. And we can see this performs better than RTX on at low settings. RTX on only really starts looking nice at high to me, so depends if you want to play a first person shooter below 50 FPS. Apex Legends was tested with either all settings at maximum or all settings at the lowest possible values as it doesn't have predefined setting presets. It still played well at ultra settings, however we could boost average FPS by 45% with all graphical settings set to minimum. Shadow of the Tomb Raider was tested with the built-in benchmark. The results from this test were looking good at higher settings, but we'll see how these results compare with some other laptops soon. Far Cry New Dawn was tested with the built-in benchmark. I wasn't seeing too much difference in this test over some 2060 laptops I've tested. For instance, the Dell G7 scored 75 FPS at ultra settings. This is a CPU heavy game though, and as we saw before, CPU performance was lacking a bit. Fortnite was tested with the replay feature, and maximum settings were easily getting us above 100 FPS, with closer to 200 possible at low and medium. Overwatch is another well optimized game, and was tested in the practice range. Even at maximum settings, above 170 FPS averages were possible, while even high settings allow us to make good use of the 240Hz panel. CSGO was tested using the Uletical FPS benchmark, and like always, high frame rates were coming out of this test. Minimum settings were almost averaging 240 FPS, a nice matchup for the 240Hz screen. Rainbow Six Siege was tested with the built-in benchmark, and is a game I've found to benefit from Nvidia's new Turing architecture. 
Even with maximum ultra settings, 144 FPS averages were possible in this test, nearing closer to the 200 mark with the low preset. PUBG was tested using the replay feature, and over 100 FPS was possible even with the settings maxed out at ultra. However, the results aren't too different from other lower spec machines I've tested. Assassin's Creed Odyssey was tested with the built-in benchmark, and from my experience, seems to be a fairly CPU heavy game. The results here are looking okay, though I have seen better results from machines with better CPU performance. Dota 2 was tested playing in the middle lane with an average amount of action going on, and it was running very smoothly without any problems at all. I've found this to depend quite a bit on the CPU, so even without 2070, the results aren't much different compared to a lower spec machine. Watch Dogs 2 is often maxing out the CPU and using all resources it can get a hold of. However, personally, I can play it just fine with 30 FPS. So even at ultra settings, we're seeing quite a good result for this game. The Witcher 3 was playing very well, with ultra settings almost averaging 100 FPS and above 60 for the 1% low. Considering that I don't think this game needs a super high frame rate, I thought this was a good result. Easily playable while looking great. If you're after more gaming benchmarks, check the card in the top right corner where I've tested 20 different games. Let's also take a look at how this config of the ASUS SCAR 3 compares with other gaming laptops to see how it stacks up. Use these results as a rough guide only, as they were tested at different times with different drivers. In Battlefield 5, I've got the SCAR 3 highlighted in red, and compared to other machines I've recently tested, it's doing quite well. Not quite as good as the 2080 Max-Q machines above it, but not too far behind, and still quite a bit better than most others due to the full 2070. It was just slightly ahead of the only other 2070 machine I've tested so far, the Aorus 15. Here are the results from Far Cry 5 with ultra settings in the built-in benchmark. This time the Aorus 15 with same specs is much closer to the SCAR 3, and the SCAR 3 is actually ahead of two of the 2080 Max-Q machines. The GX701 dominates because it was tested with G-Sync, so no Optimus bottlenecks allow it to perform better. These are the results from Shadow of the Tomb Raider with the built-in benchmark at highest settings. The results are pretty similar to what we've seen before. The SCAR 3 is way up there thanks to the 2070, just 1 FPS behind the Aorus 15 with same specs, otherwise only behind the 2080 Max-Q machines. Overall, the results here are looking quite good, at least at the higher setting levels where the 2070 can stretch its legs. Like I mentioned in my first video covering 240Hz gaming laptops, the 240Hz screen was only really beneficial in esports titles like CSGO or Overwatch that can actually push out crazy high frame rates. All games that I threw at the SCAR 3 ran without issue. At lower settings, I did notice lower performance in some cases, which seems to be a result of the lower than expected CPU performance covered earlier, which makes it harder to actually hit high FPS in esports titles to utilize the 240Hz screen when compared to other machines. Now for the benchmarking tools. I've tested Heaven, Valley, and Superposition from Unigen, as well as Firestrike, TimeSpy, Port Royal, and VRMark from 3DMark. Just pause the video if you want a detailed look at these results. As we saw earlier, we've got the option of making some changes to improve performance, so let's see how these changes actually help in gaming. Far Cry 5 was tested using the built-in benchmark at 1080p, and just to be clear, the purple bars listed as stock still had the turbo profile enabled in the ASUS Armory Crate software, as that's what I used as the default level for my game benchmarks. Anyway, we're barely seeing a difference at ultra settings, but at lower settings there's a larger improvement to 1% low due to the improved CPU performance from the undervolting. I've used Crystal Diskmark to test the storage, and the 1TB NVMe M.2 SSD was scoring well enough for the reads and writes. For updated pricing, check the links in the description, as prices will change over time. At the time of recording, in the US, the ASUS SCAR 3 gaming laptop with these specs is around $2300, while the 2060 version is substantially less at $1800. Meanwhile here in Australia, we're looking at $3100 Australian dollars for these same specs. So to conclude, the new ASUS SCAR 3 gaming laptop has some nice changes over the older SCAR 2, at least visually. Personally, I prefer the all black look without the camo pattern, and initially I thought the RGB light bar was a bit silly, but in the end it grew on me. The major issues I had with it were the thermals and lower than expected CPU performance. In games at higher settings, which to be fair you'd likely want to use to take advantage of the RTX 2070 graphics, it performed well. However, at lower settings, I did notice lower performance than what I'd expect. This seems to be due to the lower overall CPU performance in my machine. So while esports titles can take advantage of the 240Hz screen, if that's purely what you're after, you might be able to find something else that works better at lower settings. Otherwise, I thought the Keystone was a nice idea, but in the end not really useful unless you share the laptop with other people. The keyboard and touchpad worked well, 
though it would have been nice to have some larger arrow keys and have the backlight shine through the function keys. There was minimal backlight bleed under a worst case scenario, the colour gamut of the screen was decent for a gaming laptop with adequate brightness, and the overall build quality of the machine was good. Battery life seemed about on par when compared to other gaming laptops I've recently tested, and I never saw the battery drain with the 230 watt power brick in use. I like that you've got the option of quickly and easily changing between the silent, balanced and turbo profiles with a single button on the keyboard, but if you need a webcam you'll have to use an external solution as there's not one built in here. Overall it's a decent machine. It plays games well at higher settings, but it's unfortunate that it seems to run hotter than the SCAR 2 despite the appearance of a cooling redesign. Let me know what you guys thought about the new ASUS SCAR 3 gaming laptop down in the comments. And if you're new to the channel, make sure you get subscribed for future laptop reviews like this one. There are a lot of new models on the way.